You'll find our scripture in the book of Genesis, easy to find, chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35, and if you didn't bring a Bible and don't have an iPad or iPhone to use, you can use the Pew Bible, page 36. I had a wedding this weekend down in Charlottesville, an outdoor wedding in the rain. You got to think about that when you plan your wedding. It might rain, and uh, it didn't, it wasn't pouring, but it was misting, and the bride wanted to go ahead with it, so we went outside and it ended up being a beautiful wedding. But I heard, it, I heard something all weekend I had never heard before. Maybe everybody knows it but me. But uh, I heard it from a, uh, a taxi driver. who We were talking about the weather. And he said, oh, but rain on your wedding day means good luck. I'd never heard that. Later at a restaurant, the waitress, we told her we were going to a wedding. She said, oh, but don't you know that if it's raining on your wedding day, that's good luck. And then 30 minutes before the wedding, I'm on the phone with a dear friend in Austria, and we're telling her that we're at a, a wedding, getting ready to do it, and that it's raining. And she said, you know, Don, in Austria, we have an expression that when it's raining on your wedding day, that's good luck. So when we did the ceremony, I said to the bride and groom, they were going to have lots of luck. That's good. But that it would take much more than luck to have a happy, successful marriage. And you know that. It takes dependence on God. Raising a baby, raising a family, Alexi, takes more than good luck. It takes God in your life. And being a part of a church for 50 or more years, that takes a lot of commitment. That's not luck that you're still around. That's, that's God. Chapter 35, verse 27. And this is an unlikely passage to build a sermon around, but I'm going to try, so we'll see what happens. Verse 27, Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre, near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years, so nobody here has done too much. He lived to be 180 years. Then he breathed his last, and he died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. Here's the line. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Usually we say Jacob and Esau, but here Esau and Jacob buried him. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you'll take out your order of worship and look over on the back, you'll see that where I normally have a listening guide, I don't have one this time. That's on purpose. This is the kind of sermon I want you to listen closely to, and not listening to fill in a blank, but listening for what God has to say to you. And it may be very different from what he says to the person beside you. And there's room if you need to write down a name or two just between you and God, then do, feel free to do that. The message is entitled, Burying the Hatchet. That's a Native American expression. It comes from the days when warring tribes would make peace, and it is said that they would bury the hatchet, meaning that the conflict was over and that peace had come. Historians say the phrase may go back further than that, all the way back to the 1300s in Europe when uh, those fighting were said to hang up their hatchet. Hang it up. Be done with it. The war is over. We're coming together again. We live today in a world that is filled with conflict, and it's nowhere more true than in the Middle East, exactly where all these events are taking place. It's a place where Jews and Arabs fight, where Jews and Christians and Muslims fight, where tribes are in conflict. And it's gone on for centuries and centuries, and it doesn't look like there's any solution. There may be a solution, and it may be in our text today. But you don't live in the Middle East. You live in Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, Alexandria, and we see conflict all around us between, between the political parties, Republicans and Democrats, between progressives, liberals, and conservatives, and it doesn't seem like a civil word can be spoken between the two. There's always been that kind of political problem, but uh, it seems to be more vicious now than it has been in a long, long time. There's conflict at work. You and a co-worker, something happened, 
and you're not speaking, you're only saying enough to get the job done. It might be between you and your boss or you and your employees. And every one of us has some kind of conflict in our families. There's somebody, a relative, we don't talk to them much, we avoid them. We can't even remember why now that we think about it, but we're not on good terms. Conflict. What do you do with conflict? I think the larger subject today may help with that. And, and to get there, I want us to go together to the funeral home. I want us to go to the family cemetery. That's where the text is speaking of, the family cemetery. Esau and Jacob have come together for a funeral. And you know there's a funeral in your future. There's going to be a day when you gather at the family cemetery to bury somebody. And there'll be others who are already buried there. This particular cemetery, Abraham and Sarah are there. Rebecca, Esau and Isaac's mother, is there. A lot of folks are there. But they're all gone now, and there are very few who remember all those names and all those relationships. But Esau and Jacob do, and they're standing there to bury the old man. Really, the old man. Isaac, at 180 years old. I know exactly where I'm going to be buried when that time comes, and I hope it's a long time from now. I want to stay with you a long time and serve God here with you and grow old with you. The best is yet to be. The last of life for which the first is made. All of that's true. But I, when the time comes, I know where I'll be buried. I'll be buried where Audrey's family's buried. We've got other loved ones there. I've stood at the grave of, of other in that family, and one day it'll be my turn, and, and I'll be laid to rest there. This is the family cemetery for Jacob and Esau's family. Now, you know their story, don't you? We don't have time to go over all of it. It's one of the classic stories in the Bible. Go back several chapters and read up to this moment, and you'll see it. Jacob was many things, but one thing we know for sure about him is that he was a crook. He's the twin brother of Esau. He was born second, but he wanted to be first. And to get to be first, he cheated his brother out of a birthright. For a bowl of soup, his brother, kind of dim-witted, came in and was hungry and traded it all away. That's in Genesis 25. Then in chapter 27... He cheated his brother again and lied to his father over the blessing. The blessing belonged to Esau. That's when the, the, the father would put his hand on the son and pronounce a blessing. Well, with the help of his mother, Rebecca, Jacob cheated his brother and lied to his father and got the blessing. Later, he would cheat his uncle, Laban. He's a liar and a cheat. But interestingly... God finds a way to use him. God finds a way to redeem him. God has a way of forgiving. Remember that because you're going to need that in your life. Well, when Esau found out what happened, that his brother had stolen the blessing along with the birthright, he heard that his brother had said, when I get my hands on him, I'm going to kill him. And you'd have said the same thing or something like it. I'm going to wring his neck. I'm going to kill him. And so Jacob decided to follow the spatial solution. He got out of town. He got away as fast as he could. He moved away. And maybe you've done that. Maybe not geographically, but emotionally, you've moved away. You've left it all behind you. But the conflict is still there. Let me remind you, there's a funeral coming. There's a graveyard somewhere. Well, he runs far away. Twenty years have passed, and now he senses in his heart he must go home. Thomas Wolfe, the writer, said, you can't go home again. I hope he's wrong. I like what Pat Conroy, my favorite Southern writer, said. He said, a Southerner always goes home. you got to go home. And you may travel the wide world, but the longest journey you ever take might be the journey home. To get it right. The text that I read is at the end of Isaac's life. They're gathered there at the cemetery, but actually their reconciliation happened sometime earlier. They were ready for the funeral because of a reconciliation. Let me tell you 
why a reconciliation is important, why we should seek it in our lives. These two brothers are vastly different. They're twins. Maybe you're a twin. Are you exactly like your twin brother or sister? It's interesting, children all growing up, twins or not, tw children growing up in the same family, same parents, same grandparents, can be so different in personality and outlook. So it was for Jacob and Esau. Very, very different. But that day at the cemetery, when they're standing there, they're the only two really left, some things become very clear. First of all, their common humanity. They're both human beings. Remember that about your enemy. She's a human being too. And you're really not that different when you boil it all down. A common humanity. These two boys also uh, are mindful that they have a common father. Their father, Isaac, father to both of them. And the same family. You've got a family. And something else. They share a common destiny. Because it's Isaac's funeral today, later it will be theirs. It becomes very, very clear. President John F. Kennedy was speaking at the American University just a few months before his death. He was talking about conflict in the world and world peace. He said this, Our most common link is that we, are, we all inhabit this same small planet we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. They recognized all that they had in common. So when did the reconciliation really happen? If it didn't happen here, it happened a few chapters back. Go back to chapter 32. And I want you to write this down if you write down anything. People change. People change. Jacob changes in chapter 32. He's making his way home. He knows that it's right, but he's very afraid to go. He's filled with dread at what might happen. In 32, verse 7, in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and the herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. He had sent a servant ahead to his brother to announce that he was coming, that he wanted a reconciliation. Uh, we don't know exactly what Esau said, but he did say this, Tell my brother I'm coming to meet him, and I got 400 men with me. You know, when you don't see somebody say it, you just hear those words. You just read the email. There's no emotion there. You can't tell what they mean. All Jacob hears is that his brother's coming, and he's coming with 400 men. Doesn't sound good. And so Jacob is afraid. In fear and distress, he, he makes some plans with his family. Then in verse 9, Jacob prayed, Oh God, and he asked God to smooth the way to make it possible. Look at the end of that chapter, the end of chapter 32, verse 22. Jacob's been changing, but he has a tremendous experience at the end of this chapter. Chapter 32, verse 22. That night, Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Have you ever been wrestling through the night so much that you couldn't sleep, wrestling with a problem. You got a test the next day, a final exam that determines everything. You got an important meeting. You've got a, a conflict to resolve you're not sure about. You wrestle through the night. Well, Jacob does, but it's a literal wrestling. He wrestled with a man until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, What's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men 
and have overcome. It says it was a man, but it's not really a man. It seemed to be a man. But as the wrestling goes on, it becomes obvious that this is God in some pre-incarnate state. God is wrestling with Jacob and touches him in his, the, 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 the socket of his thigh and, and makes him somewhat lame the rest of his life. And the, and the man, God says, let me go. And Jacob very wisely says, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. And God blessed him that day, gave him a new name. Not Jacob, but Israel. And we know him that way too. People change, and Jacob changed. He had an encounter with God. I'm wondering, have you had an encounter with God? Have you ever been alone and wrestled with God and got things right with him? You see, all of us are, are, are wandering. We've all gone astray like sheep. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. He bore our sin and took it away, but we're still running from God. We don't know that the conflict is over, and so God's Spirit comes looking for us to bless us. Have you had that experience where he has changed your life? Jacob's going home. He's got the hardest meeting he's ever had, but he's ready because God has changed his life. Now, he's afraid because his brother is a big guy and kind of mean, and, uh, and he's coming with 400 men. So Jacob is expecting the worst. But listen, if God could change Jacob, who's to say he couldn't change Esau too? The reason maybe you have not sought reconciliation with that family member or that long-lost friend, maybe the reason is it could be pride on your part. You're just not willing to humble yourself. But it could also be fear. You're afraid of what they'll say. You're afraid of stirring things up again. And, and so you avoid it. Listen, you don't know, but that God has been working in that person's life all the while. And just like God changed you, He's, you don't know this because you haven't talked to him in a year or two or five or 20. You don't know. But God is always working in our world. He's always injecting his life, insinuating himself into our situations. Look at what happens to Esau. Look at chapter 33, Genesis 33. Jacob looked up. And there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. Those were the closest ones to his heart. He himself went on ahead. He's a man. He goes out in front. He doesn't let the women fight for him. He goes out front. It's his problem. He has to face the music. He's out front, and when he sees his brother, he bows down to the ground seven times. That's a sign of humility. But Esau ran to meet Jacob. Here it comes. But not with a sword, not with a hatchet. He runs to meet him and embraces him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Who are all these people Esau wants to know? See, they haven't had reunions. They, they haven't exchanged mail and pictures at Christmas. They, they haven't spoken. Who are all these people? And they're, they're passing around now the photographs, and they're, they're talking about their families. And, and Jacob wants to give Esau things, and Esau said, no, I don't need it. Look, I'm wealthy too. I've been blessed too. I don't need any of that. They are reconciled. Now, it is possible that the person you've had conflict with is just as mean as they ever were, haven't changed a bit. It's all settled down deep in their soul. That is possible, but you won't know. You won't know until you go. And that's the main thing I want to say to you today. You've got to get up, and you've got to go. You've got to go and seek to bury the hatchet. Turn in the New Testament for a minute to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' famous sermon. And look at verse 23. 
5.23. And it seems, Jesus seems to be addressing a church scene. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in the front of the altar. I love that he says that. Don't take it home. Don't take your offering home today. Leave it here. We'll hold it for you <laughs> while you get things straight. Leave your gift there in the front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. You get to church and you realize somebody's got something against you. Now, it's... it's it's not reality, it's their perception, but they've got something against you. Turn over to chapter 18 of Matthew. Chapter 18 of Matthew, and look at verse 15, 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you will have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. He goes on with how we're to handle these sorts of things. But it hardly ever gets to that because we don't do the first thing he said. If you've got something against somebody, somebody's hurt you, somebody's offended you, go. Now put those two passages together chapter 5 and chapter 18. Maybe somebody has something against you. Maybe you've got something against somebody else, but it doesn't matter. The Christian always must take the initiative. The Christian, you must always take the initiative and go. Now that's what Jacob is doing. Now Jacob was clearly in the wrong. He had offended his brother he had, he had just made a mess of the whole family. He's going home. But I love the way that he does it. He's going. He's humbling himself. He picks the time. He picks the place. He rehearses his speech. He knows what he's going to say. He anticipates his brother's likely response. Doesn't look like it's going to be good, so he anticipates that. He prays and asks God for help. Don't dare go without asking God's help. Now, go. Don't write an email. Don't write a letter. Don't put a long confession on paper. No. You know, emails, you know how they are. You, you, they're short, and you never know the emotion behind it. Email is not a good way to communicate. And uh, long letters, even if you write a long letter and pour it all out, you say everything you still don't know how the recipient is responding because you can't see their face. And so much of response comes from the face. You can't look them in the eye. So go. He does that. He rehearses. He's got gifts. He's trying to make restitution. He does everything right. I'm, I'm reminded of the prodigal son story, you know, one of Jesus' great stories about the son who left home. He was kind of a mess, too. He, he runs far away, ends up in a pig pen of all places, and one day the Bible says he comes to himself. He's, he's in the mud with the pigs. He has nothing to eat, and he comes to himself, and he says, my servant, my father's servant's back home. They at least have something to eat and a, a warm bed at night. Here's what I will do. I will get up, and I will go home. And he even rehearses his speech. I'll go home, and when I see my father, I'll say, Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy anymore. Make me one of your slaves. He gets up and he goes. Sure enough, his father comes out at him. But instead of with a whip or instead of to rebuke him, the father wraps his arms around him. The son tries to make his little speech. Father, I've sinned, but the father stops him. It's all forgiven. There's a ring, there's a robe, there's a fatted calf. There's a great celebration. People change. Is there somebody in your life that you need to bury the hatchet with? As a Christian, it's going to be very important going forward for you to go ahead and do it because... 
there's a cemetery and there's, there's a funeral home where arrangements need to be made. They were able, these two brothers were able to come together that day to bury their father because a few years earlier they'd gotten it straight. I want you to get it straight. I'm thinking of uh, funeral homes and cemeteries, I'm reminded of my friend Lawrence, who uh, was not a churchgoer at all, had no time for God and religion and all that stuff. But his brother died, and so it was to him to make the arrangements. He's sitting in the funeral home across the desk from the funeral director, and they're going through all the arrangements. And the funeral director looks at Lawrence and says, now, what church are you with? Who is your pastor? And it, it dawned on Lawrence, hit him right between the eyes that he didn't have a church. He didn't have a pet, never thought he needed one. And the barrenness of his soul came to the surface. And he went looking. He found me. He met Christ as his Savior, and, and right now he's a leader in that church. It happened in a funeral home when the hatchet of his rebellion against God was buried. I want us to pray now. Would you bow with me, please? We're going to sing in a moment. There may be somebody here who needs somebody to pray with them. I'd love to do that. We'll uh, have somebody pray with you. You just come and settle things with God. If you're here today and you're ready to give your heart to Christ, to be reconciled to Him, He's been looking for you all this time. Now you step out and respond to His love. We'll pray with you. Or if you want to join our church as a Christian, there's certainly a place here for you. We would love for you to be a part of us. You step out and just come to the front where I am, and we will uh, welcome you. Father, bless now your people as we respond to your voice. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand.